designer and that, and uh, I ended up uh, with ArborJet, and now I became a certified arborist with them, and uh, we were established in 2000, and we've just been quietly growing. We acquired uh, a call gel and a partnership in 2018, and now we're kind of uh, broadening our range of markets. It allowed us to come out with our uh, ArborRx uh, program that I'm going to talk a little bit about tonight. And uh, <clears throat> we're very committed to environmentally responsible. And that's kind of what I'm going to talk to you about tonight uh, with this PHC and talk about some of the different tools that you guys can have in your toolbox uh, with that. So uh, we have many highly engineered products covering your uh, landscape from soil to crown. And we're going to talk a little bit about them as we move forward. So field support wise, we have uh, 12 reps now with uh, the commercial team, which will be our turf side. Uh, I'm in the mid-Atlantic, Kevin Brueger is in the Northeast, JB is in the Southeast, Kevin Lewis covers the Midwest, and Joe Aiken is the Great Lakes in Canada. Uh, Jay Goffner is covering the upper Midwest, uh, Emmett's in the South Central, and Corey Laffey is now covering the High Plains, and we've got Marianne Waddell and Don Fluharty in the Northwest. So <clears throat> there's been an increase in invasive species uh, throughout the United States, and we're going to talk about some of these pests today. Uh, Asian longhorn beetle, we're all familiar with the emerald ash borer, uh, mountain pine beetle, hemlock woolly adelgia, uh, polyphagous shot hole borer for people on the west coast, uh, pinewood nematodes, uh, sudden oak uh, death, many different pest oak wilts, and uh, the new favorite spotted lanternfly we're going to talk about, and then we're going to briefly touch on the beef leech disease that seems to be spreading throughout uh, Ohio and into New York and uh, Pennsylvania. So Opportunities, what's out there for applicators or plant health care? You know, essentially you're adding a service line to your business, whether you're uh, an arborist just removing trees or if you're a landscaper wanting to get into the line, this is a different type of uh, service line for you. You don't have to uh, have a subcontractor with this. You guys can do the work yourself if you have your uh, pesticide license, which makes it very easy for it. Uh, Less callback scenarios if you don't have a subcontractor doing this work. Uh, liability, increased efficiency uh, and efficacy of treatments when you're doing it yourself. Uh, there's less scheduling issues when you're getting into injections. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, treat where mo other methods aren't an option. So this is essentially uh, by the water, a school, any of those uh, urban environments that we run into now. Typically, there's no pre-notifications required in most states. Uh, increased profitability, generally 60 to 70 percent gross profit with this business, which is great for you guys, uh, <clears throat> and delivering expected results that protect trees effectively. So what do we ask ourselves, you know, uh, some of the internal market questions that we are, uh, we're going to ask, <clears throat> are there tree killing or human irritating pest, uh, an invasive pest that's in the market that's going to drive a need? Uh, are there new pests attacking tree years new me? How do we find this out? Well, we're going to find this out by uh, registering for the extension agents to give us controls. Uh, all these are different options that we can do. Um, signing up for uh, newsletters from different uh, groups you know, uh, going out and visiting uh, different groups, you know, your master gardeners, listening to some of their programs, uh, going to some um, schools, Rutgers, or anything like that, any university that's giving updates or weekend courses. These are all opportunities for us to educate ourselves on what's out there in the market, what, what is driving this uh, need for plant health care. Uh, so prospects, that's what we're going to get into next. So what are some of the potential prospects? So municipalities, uh, city foresters, arborists, uh, HOAs, uh, public work directors, uh, you know, county foresters, extension agents, you know, property management companies. These are all areas that you guys can uh, reach out to and find new leads, uh, different avenues of business, um, you know, visiting your local nursery or greenhouses and maybe offering to do stuff for them or being a legit service there. 
these are all ways to prospect and find different uh, avenues of business for you guys in plant health care. Um, so what does plant health care mean kind of moving forward in that, you know, <clears throat> it was an ISA adapted term from IPM in the 1980s, you know, because the public focused too much on the pest part of IPM. So we went into plant health care, you know, and what is that? It's a holistic approach to managing plant health uh, by monitoring the environment, insect disease, population, species, selection. So what we're doing, guys, is we're setting ourselves up to come out to the property and take a walk through and determine what, what is going on in the property. So when we're setting up this plant health care, we're trying to determine a program that we're going to be doing with this. So <clears throat> we're looking at, are we going to go out? We're going to visit the property and we're going to make suggestions. So we're, we're going to get paid when we come out to the property. So we're going to set up whether we're doing one site visit a year, two site visits, three site visits, however you set it up, you know, gold, silver, platinum, you know, what, whatever the way you want to do it is how we're going. <clears throat> and then essentially what we're going to do with that, we're providing them a service. We're going to monitor their yard, whether we're coming out in the spring to do a fertilization Maybe we see that their trees have a mite and then we would write up another <clears throat> estimate or bid for that uh, product. So it's a, a, a always expanding our business. And the other thing that I just want to mention briefly before I move on to the next thing is when you're building this business, try to stay in a location, in a neighborhood. Build your prospects so you're, you're staying locally in your neighborhood so you don't have a lot of travel time. And that will cut down on your labor cost or your lost time traveling to different parts of the <clears throat> area. So what are we providing? <clears throat> well, with tree injection, we're providing a highly effective solution, whether it's invasives or different pests. It's very cost effective. We can do it uh, quickly. It lasts a long time. Emerald ash borer, we're getting two years of control. The real nice thing with this, guys, is the chemistry stays in the tree, so it's a lot cleaner and safer. Uh, so we're, we're not putting anything into the environment when we do this. We're injecting it straight into the tree. Uh, your expertise with this is you're giving a cutting edge uh, arboriculture technology. You know, you're kind of like a doctor going out with the bag because you don't have the big spray truck. You're walking out there with your tool in your toolbox and you're going to visit this area. And the other nice thing is, is you're not going to be disrupting life around you. You don't have to worry about the dogs in the next yard. You don't have to worry about the kids playing in the other yard. You're injecting into the tree, so it's very safe and solution. So moving forward with that, let's talk about the advantages of tree injection. So the big advantage here, guys, is we can nearly treat for every disease, uh, insect or disease issue out there. It's not always going to be the right choice, but it is a tool to have in your toolbox. Uh, the one example I like to give is if we had a hedge uh, of arborvitaes or lelands that have bagworms, it would probably be more economical to go out there with our spray truck and just spray it. But now if we have a hedge around a pool, this may be an advantage to do a tree injection because we don't want to spray into the pool. So lowest possible dose with high, highest efficacy is what we're seeing with this. <clears throat> we can treat in the rain or wind. I'm not saying that you can go out after it's been raining for five days, but if, if it's just raining that day, you can still treat. If it's windy, we no longer have to worry about spray issues. We can go out and do it. Uh, if you're on the golf course, we're never interrupting play or in parks. This is one of the nice things with that. So talk a little bit about the process. You know, it's pretty much go out to the tree, determine what the pest or disease is, and then it's three steps. You're going to base it off the diameter at breast height. You're going to drill into the tree an inch to inch and a half, set the plug, and then inject with uh, whatever device you choose. Uh, the F-Series, the Quick Jet Air, these are all different tools <coughs> that we use. So getting into the, the key process, uh, if we want to go ahead to the next slide, we'll, we'll talk to where we're, we're drilling. Um, essentially, what we're doing here, guys, uh, when we get to the drill site is where's the key target areas that we're going to drill when we're doing these injections. Typically, you're going to go anywhere from 0 to 18, 24 inches from soil level. The ideal area, as you can see with the arrows in this diagram, is that root flare, the, the key six inch, 0 to 6 inch area. You're not going to go to where it's flat. 
you're going to stay in those root flares and inject in those and avoid the valleys from it. <clears throat> you're going to watch for decay when you're drilling into the tree. You know, are you seeing white uh, xylem tissue? If you see brown, then you probably won't want to inject into that area because there's something going on there. You're always going to drill perpendicular into the tree. Uh, that, that's very key to do. You drill in perpendicular to the tree and, and you're going to go through the cambium into the xylem tissue. You're going to keep spacing typically six inches apart one from the other. Never use dull drill bits. Typically, you're always going to use high helix drill bits. We sell a nice one that we've patented and we've seen uh, increased injection speeds with this because the way it removes the material from the tree. So <clears throat> talking more about the drill bits and needles, uh, what am I going to do? You know, am I going to go plugless? Am I going to use plugs? What are the advantages, disadvantages? Uh, here with this slide, you can see that we have 62% 60 faster uptake with our drill bits. So our number four, four plug would be a 3 8 brad point. The number three is a 9 30 seconds. And then our stinger needle would be 7 30 seconds. So why do we want to use the Arbor plug? And we're going to talk about that in this slide coming up right here. <clears throat> Essentially, the Arbor plug is a one-way gate valve, guys. Number one, it's going to keep the material in the tree. Typically, you can lose materials when you do a plugless injection. But number two, it's going to keep any pest or disease away from the tree. And number three, the big advantage of this, guys, is the tree will compartmentalize faster over this. And typically in the Mid-Atlantic, we've seen eight to ten months, the tree compartmentalizes over that plug to where we can't see it. So that's a real big advantage to me in that aspect. And taking a look at this um, next slide coming up is the setting of the plug. And I think when we're going out to do plant health care, th this is truly a very um, important step. Uh, as you can see in the upper left, that's just placed in the tree. A shallow set, that's where we get uh, where guys are saying that they're seeing damage or we're causing wounding. Because if you're using a higher pressure device, you could separate the cambium from it because that plug is not set in the xylem tissue properly. And you want those three barbs on that plastic plug set in that tree. The third picture on the right is the deep set. That's just costing us production. We're just not using all the vascular tissue that's alive because we set that plug. So I would rather see that over a shallow set any day of the week. Uh, the bottom left is a proper set. And then the bottom uh, right would be the uh, one year later, kind of what the plug set looks like. So that's just the basic steps for that. And now getting into some of the demands, what we're seeing plant health care wise, we're seeing a lot more tree issues, whether it's lacanium scales, uh, different boring insects, uh, oak wilt seems to be spreading, uh, micronutrients deficiencies, bacterial leaf scorch, fire blight which we'll talk about all these coming up more. Uh, emerald ash borer, it's still out there. We still need to worry about it. We still need to treat. It's still active. Um, a couple um, webinars ago, Joe Aiken talked about it. You know, EAB is still active in Michigan. So we still need to pay attention to those things and, and what's going on with it. <clears throat> and I am gonna talk just kind of a refresher coming up too about the different uh, biotic versus abiotic stresses that are out there because I think it is important when we're out trying to look at plant health care and, and what we're looking at to determine it. So <clears throat> coming up here, we're going to talk about biotic versus abiotic. Uh, you know, a biotic stress or disease is directly caused by a living organism. You know, whether it's insects, fungus, bacteria, uh, Dutch elm disease, oak wilt, these are all symptoms that have a very obvious pattern. Uh, they're usually isolated, you know, in a local vicinity. Uh, we may see evidence of a pest or pathogen. They may cause other uh, pests to come in because they weaken the tree in that sense. So we'll take a look at this. Uh, Japanese beetles, pine wilt disease, horned oak gull wasps. All these are different types of issues that we will be dealing with uh, <clears throat> in this coming up. So can we go ahead and move forward a little bit? So 
biotic versus abiotic. You know, abiotic stress is caused by non-limbing factors, drought, nutrients, soil conditions, different chemical injuries, uh, spray drift, you know, something that came on, uh, different things like that. Construction damage, key photo, you know, someone came in and dug out the roots. We may not see that stress for a couple of years, but five years down the road, we're going to wonder what happened there. So these are all some of the different things that we'll see when we're out in the landscape. Uh, and we're going to talk more about it and get into it a little bit. So some of the common um, abiotic causal agents uh, coming up <clears throat> would be uh, low oxygen, diffusion rates, you know, a construction site, um, dysfunctional root systems, soil pH extremes, uh, de-icing chemicals, salt, you know, that, that's a killer in the Midwest. Up in the New England states, we have a lot of salt damage. Uh, chronic drought, we've had weather extremes in that sense, uh, where a tree would repeatedly defoliate, uh, whether uh, <clears throat> it's drought, uh, anything like that, landscape chemicals, um, lawn care guy came in and sprayed Roundup, caused some damage to that, uh, root loss, um, the dumpster sitting on the root mass, all these are issues that we'll see as abiotic, which causes <clears throat> the death of a tree, you know. So typically healthy trees will have stress, whether it's drought, insect disease, or anything like that. And we may get a bit of treatment of watering, mulch it, pruning, giving it some fertilization, uh, some air spading, anything like that. And then if we get into the no treatment, that's where the, the stress trees can go into a decline. And, and either we do something about it or the trees in an urban environment or it's out in the middle of a city streetscape that's not taken care of and we're going to result get a dead tree. So that's explained by <clears throat> this Mannion's disease spiral, uh, which, you know, talks about a healthy tree having predisposing factors, uh, phytophthora, soil characteristics, you know, all these things are inciting factors that are going to affect a tree. You know, inadequate cultural practices. Did we not water it enough? Uh, did we never prune it? Uh, it had something attack it and now we have dead branches and, you know, we could clean that tree up and it would probably look a lot nicer. Uh, so opportunist pathogens, you know, did it get really stressed and some boring insects came in and these boring insects carried uh, some sort of pathogen which killed the tree in turn. So these are all things that we have to look for when we're out doing plant health care. And now kind of getting into the disease spiral of things, guys, what, what are we looking at here? Flagging symptoms, you know, uh, ceridian canker on Leland Cypress. You can see the photos of the sap dripping, uh, dead branches. You know, what, what, what are we going to do with that? So coming up right now, we're going to talk about it. You know, Leland Cypress, Italian Cypress, uh, ornamental junipers. Uh, they can be attacked. They, they seem to be a weaker tree in some instances of it. They're very fast growing. Uh, they can be blown over in the wind. Uh, these cankers can affect um, many things. You get a heavy resin flow coming at them. They're unattractive. Um, Botrysphyria canker is another one that we have to watch for. Uh, these spores spread by the wind, water. So if we get a rain, they splash, they move on. Uh, you always want to prune out the infected limbs and water and mulch it. Uh, you could treat this with a, an injection or a bark spray with phosphojet. That's going to turn on the plant's natural defense system uh, with the phosphoric acids. These are all different uh, parts and things that we can use and do um, some of these plants. Uh, another option might be to use a growth regulator, you know, shortstop. That may help improve the tree health, slow it down. And we're going to talk more about that coming up. Nutrient will aid with water availability. You know, Nutriroot is a moisture manager product. It has a little bit of MPK in it, and it also has uh, some Cytogrow, which is a seaweed extract. So these would give you tools <clears throat> to help reduce the stress on the tree, in addition to your pruning and everything else to slow this process. So ceridian canker pictures, these are just some additional pictures showing you the bleeding canker. Um, if it's brown, Let's just cut it down, guys. I mean, that, that's a simple, good plant health care knowledge. If great, if we can't, then we're going to move on. Uh, the next thing would be hypoxylin canker. 
This is another opportunist pathogen that attacks stressed or weak trees. Um, they're not host specific, but they do like oaks. They're one of the more common ones. And it's an infection through the bark that will cause a rapid degradation to the vascular tissue. Uh, if it gets into the main stem, um, the tree will probably die. We, you know, if we can get it before it gets into that, we may be able to stall it off or, or postpone what may happen. So same issue there, we would use phosphojet, uh, shortstop and neutral to reduce that stress. Um, some of the other stages of hypoxylon canker would be the asexual stage. Uh, the sexual stage is in the center and then you'll get the inactive and the dead trees. Some of the other things that we see out in the landscape, guys, would be herbicide, chemical injuries. You know, so we're looking for unusual symptoms here, whether it's stunting, misshaped leaves, some scorch, uh, affected species. So when we're looking at trees in the landscape, we need to look at everything around it. You know, did they spray Roundup in the area? Is their turf dead in those certain areas? Ask questions to the homeowner. Was there other applications done? Uh, when, when were they done? What was the timing of it? These are all different things that we want to talk about and see and notice in the landscape because they make differences. They, they, they can make us heroes if we catch something that happened that wasn't caused by us that we see, you know. So those are all things that we should ask about and see <clears throat> and do. So biotic versus abiotic disorders here, you know. What's the pictures of? Let, let's take a guess. You know, ab abiotic scorch, severe nutrient deficiencies. The fire blight, we, we see the black. It looks like it's burned with that, the bacterial disease there. So getting into that disease, let's talk about it a little bit more. What, what are our options with that? <clears throat> Irwina amylorva, man, I love those words. Uh, it's a bacteria, guys, that spreads. It, there's 75 members of the rose family that it will attack. Uh, typically it thrives on cool, wet weather, which, you know, we really haven't had a lot of, but we may see it. Uh, serviceberry, mountain ash, and quince and hawthorns are all uh, under attack with this. So some of the symptoms that we'll see is wilted blossoms, uh, brown leaves that will remain on the plant, uh, as you can see there, uh, shoots, cankers on the stem uh, that are very unattractive, uh, a shepherd's crook. And that and wet destroyed fruit. So, what are our treatment options with this? Um, getting into that a little bit, you could plant resistant varieties. I mean, that's the smart thing to do. Uh, dormant pruning, uh, removing the infection, and you're going to disinfect your pruners or your saws in between the cuts. Uh, that's key. Uh, then consider trunk injection as a way to treat for this, guys. It's another tool uh, with that. Whether you're using uh, our Arbor OTC and trying to do the injection before uh, leaf or before flower drop and leaf out, so timing's really difficult, or if you choose to do a phosphojet injection to try to suppress the symptoms, these are all different tools that you can do and use. Um, you might even consider using shortstop as another way to strengthen the tree's uh, defense system on that. So there's different tools and different things that you can do uh, with these things, guys. So bacterial leaf scorch is the next disease that I want to talk about uh, <clears throat> a little bit. So you're going to get marginal necrosis. And typically your uh, scorch sense symptoms are very isolated and they're on the same limbs year after year. Uh, in the long run, depending on the type of tree, it will uh, kill the tree over time. Uh, the hotter the summer, the more symptoms you're going to see. Uh, you could treat trees with... Uh, Pactributrazole or shortstop to a C would be one tool that you could use for this. Some other options that I wanted to talk about <clears throat> is uh, treating with Imaget to kill the vector. You know, uh, trying to kill the vectors that spreading the disease would be key. Uh, you're going to treat with Arbor OTC. This is a suppression treatment, guys. You're never going to cure bacterial leaf scorch. It's going to suppress the symptoms. Uh, this photo is rather unique, guys. Uh, this was one of my customers in Pennsylvania, and uh, he's been doing this for probably 10 years now, and this is year four, and the neighbor's tree never decided to treat. And he treated with uh, OTC and Phosphojet, 
and he did this every other year. Typically, we recommend a yearly application, but he chose to do the OTC and phosphojet, and he's been able to go every other year, and then he'll do a vertical mulch in the off year for treatment. And he's seen great results because the neighbor's trees uh, has moved on now. So the next uh, invasive disease that I want to talk about that's new, some of you may have heard of, some of you may have not, is beech leaf disease. Uh, it's been around since probably 2012 when it was first identified. It, it's spreading on uh, most beach, beach species. As you can see in the leaves, you get some dark banding uh, and it, the leaves become twisted. Uh, the new leaves immediately show the symptoms. They're very thick and leathery, um, and it's spreading, guys. It's moving fairly quickly, and, and essentially it will kill the tree uh, in the end. Talking about the maps, you know, pretty much all cultivars are being effective. Healthy trees are being killed within a period of six years. Um, it's ugly. They, they do believe that it's a nematode uh, native to Japan. And the adults and eggs uh, seem to be overwintering in the buds. So when the new leaves emerge, we, we see damage uh, almost already evident. And it's very mobile, like any of our invasive pests that we've dealt with. Uh, they also believe that there's a micro vector that's involved with it. And right now we've got it in Ohio, New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey. So it's moving. We need to keep our eyes out for it. This is another thing, uh, another possible thing that we can treat for. So <clears throat> these are some additional photos. Uh, we have been seeing some effectiveness with our amectin benzoate uh, triage G4 or uh, our triage R10 uh, treating for the nematode. Uh, and we're going to monitor that. Uh, we've seen pretty decent results with that. And then we're doing some ongoing research with that. So next slide is going to be uh, Asian longhorn beetle. Just kind of wanted to give an update. Uh, there's been some um, showings or reinfestations, I believe, in New York that we're going to talk about. Uh, this pest is pretty much controlled by the USDA, uh, but there are opportunities when they do offer treatments. But typically, their uh, targets and idea for this has been removal when they did it. But we're going to talk about the pest and give you guys a little bit of an overview of it. Uh, a lot of stuff has been done with Rutgers Cooperative Extension with this, uh, the U.S. Forest Service and private, and then uh, Project Director uh, William T. Hubuk. And that is the uh, lovely Asian longhorn beetle, or ALB, in the picture. And we're going to talk about that now a little bit moving forward. So <clears throat> the picture on the left is the Asian longhorn beetle, the male. Uh, the female looks a little bit larger on the right. Um, why is this a threat? Well, let's look at it. Let, let's look at what it's doing. You know, uh, the big thing is it has host tree, it hosts many tree species between 15 to 20. And there are no natural predators as usual. Uh, you can see the large holes that it seems to leave in the trees uh, when they lay it. And the uh, larvas remain hidden for most of the year. Uh, once the pest gets in the heartwood, you really can't treat for it. In native lands, you know, it only attacks the wheat trees, but here in the Northeast, the maple forest, it can run uh, wild, you know, and the damage could be a lot more severe for this pest. Uh, host species. Mostly susceptible trees would be your Norway maples, which I know most people wouldn't would be happy to see them go, but red maples, silver maples, sugar maples, your elms, uh, box elders, your black alders, your birch trees, pussy willows are moderately susceptible. Uh, some additional <clears throat> trees that would be less would be your uh, green ash, your white ash, sycamores, uh, rose of Sharon, hackberries, uh, some of the resistance trees would be your crab apples, uh, cherry plums, hawthorns, black uh, and honey locusts, your oaks, tap, uh, uh, flowering dogwoods, your ginkgo trees, red buds. These would be your uh, resistant trees. So let's talk about the history. All right. Where did this pest come from? Because it's been a while since uh, we've really talked about it. So it's native to China, Korea, Taiwan, Japan, and it came into the U.S. on wooden pallets, you know, 
typically how all of our pests come in uh, uh, on freight of some way. Um, it was discovered in New York in 1996. Uh, there was a new infestation discovered in 2019, and they're planning on doing some management in 2020. Uh, it was found in Chicago in 1998, and uh, they said that they've eradicated it. There were some new finds in Ohio, and they're trying to eradicate it and take care of it. Uh, new Jersey was active in it, uh, and Massachusetts has had it quite a bit, and there's been some flare-ups in that aspect of it. So this is a pest we should be looking for. Uh, we need to notify people about it. Uh, these maps show uh, the hot spots where it's been located. Uh, you can see that it's been out west. It's been uh, up and down. There's been some sightings in the south. Uh, the map coming up here <clears throat> is going to show the active spots, you know, the history of it. Uh, as you can see, you know, it was eradicated in 2011, but now uh, th there was uh, they, another detection in December of 2019. So they're going to be doing some more work. It's been throughout New York, uh, Ohio, we've seen it. So this pest, we're trying to eradicate it, but it still keeps creeping back in. It still keeps coming back into the area. Um, we need to keep our eye out. It's definitely one of those invasive pests that we should be worried about because um, it attacks trees. One of the different things with this though is it really doesn't move until it kills the tree. So they'll really stay in one localized area and attack, and tree, attack a tree until it's dead. Um, New England is pretty high risk, you know, uh, with their forested areas, you know, uh, attacking it. And they were under attack with the gypsy moth and winter moth. So all this, uh, you know, is a scary thought when we get into different invasive pests. And they just don't seem to be going away. Um, Massachusetts regulated area you can kind of see in this map uh, the areas that have been regulated that they're watching uh, that the USDA will come in and choose eradication or they'll choose to treat depending on what they want to do since it's their uh, pests that they're monitoring the life cycle so it's kind of interesting watching this uh, life cycle of that uh, early stage it's a larva mid stage it's another uh, a little bit larger larva and that will uh, pupate into the adult beetle and typically the adult beetle will be alive um, for I believe two months uh, but look at the damage you know in the middle picture on the left the size of the holes you know a dime size hole coming out of the tree so it's definitely a concern of what that does and how it affects it so signs and symptoms we're going to talk a little bit more in depth, and I want to show you guys some photos of it and give you some idea of what the larva damage really looks like uh, and what's going on to the tree. I mean, it's really causing some severe damage to it in that sense. Uh, with the coarse frass that you see that it's emitting out of it, uh, the curled up antenna on this as it continues to grow, um, larva do a lot of feeding damage in that sense. In, in the branch and the crotches of the tree. Uh, that, that's where they seem to be doing their uh, work and their damage. Uh, the adult damage, as you can see, the holes, uh, the feeding on the leaves, uh, some of the branches that are damaged. Um, it's kind of severe in that sense. Uh, the picture on the right is egg laying damage on what it looks like. The exit holes are three eighths or larger. So, I mean, that, that's a big hole to have nothing coming in or out of it. Um, so, adults feeding on the leaf veins. Uh, some of the lar larva development, though. So, after the egg hatch, they'll develop into a grub-like larva and they'll burrow into the tree. And they're going to have up to um, first and second end stars. And then they're going to get into the third and fourth and fifth end stars that get into the tree. And then they'll typically overwinter in the uh, larval stages of the tree. And the eggs can stay overwinter too, so it is protected in that aspect of it. Uh, pupil development is in the fifth uh, instar, which it'll t approximately take two to three weeks. 
this is a non-feeding or an active uh, during metamorphosis. And after this, typically the, the adult will emerge, completing the life cycle. So the adult beetle will typically emerge in late spring to mid fall in the Northeast, May to October. Uh, you know, exit holes there, three eighths to five eighths in diameter. A beetle is 0.75 to 1.25 inches. So that's really causing some severe damage on that tree. So the adult Asian longhorn beetle, guys, uh, this is what it looks like. There are some, there are some imposters. The white spotted pine sore or the cottonwood borer are very similar in appearance. Uh, and they have white bodies on their back. You can see a picture of that on the bottom. Uh, the long antenna is one and a half to two and a half times uh, on the body with the black and white bands. And there's a bluish tinge on the bug, if you can see on the feet, if the picture is clear enough. Uh, larval damage, you know, this is very coarse for ass from the feeding. This is some of the damage that you see. And that's definitely going to disrupt uh, what's going on in the tree and that aspect of it. Um, and what have we seen from the quarantines, guys? The removals. Essentially, when they come in for an ALB, they eradicate and they remove everything. They take everything down and then you have a street that has small trees. And, and some of the issues with this is... Homeowners will not be as uh, abrupt to come out and say they have an infestation because they're worried that they're going to lose all their trees. So sometimes they'll try to hide it and protect that and that aspect of it. And Kale, I don't know if you want to take a break now or if you want to keep going. Uh, what's your thoughts? Okay, is there any questions before we go so far? Yeah, I have two things here that I'd like to uh, put past you. Uh, Derek Fodoraro, Fodoraro um, was asking if the term integrated pest management uh, could work in the place of saying like plant health care. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and then the other one is Robert Collins uh, was talking about, he mentioned that he saw um, one of the Asian longhorn beetles at his house in Western Virginia. So wow. what, if you're somebody who's watching right now, if you see and can recognize that you have one of these pests around, uh, what do you do? I would contact uh, the extension agent or uh, the U.S. Uh, forester in your area and have them come out and inspect it. That would be the proper thing to do. Okay. Uh, and then Gary Thacker's asking uh, if there are any developers uh, who are currently being mindful in the quarantined areas uh, of these problems or if they're just going ahead planting tons of maple trees. Well, uh, I think it's kind of funny uh, to give that, I, you know, I, I think there's becoming more uh, diversity out there, but uh, probably five years ago when I just started with ArborJet, I went into a neighborhood in Delaware, and uh, just as he said, a developer came in and planted all uh, six, four to six inch ash trees, which mm. the guy was calling me about ash anthracnose, and I said, well, you've got a lot bigger problem because emerald ash borer is going to come in and get them. So do I think we need to work on that? Yes, because I think people go after the good deal. And I'm sure the ash trees were really, really good deal to do that. But if there's problems or issues in the areas, then we, we need to worry about it. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I think that's all we have right now. We're okay. going to do a quick uh, five or six minute break um, so we can get some water and stand up walk around and then we will be right back with all of the gross spotted lantern fly pictures that uh that you can find on the internet so stick with us here 
We have a bunch of great webinars just like this one scheduled on our Facebook page. So make sure to RSVP to the Facebook event pages for updates. On May 28, we will be hosting a webinar on work positioning for safety with West Coast trainer Craig Bachman. Two free ISA CEUs will be available for anyone who watches this webinar live. On June 25th, you can tune in to our webinar about aerial friction and rigging techniques, hosted by Rich Hattier. You can earn two free CEUs by watching live. Keep checking our Facebook events page to stay up to date with all of the great webinars that are on the horizon. We have a new site search game active now on TreeStuff. Use the search function to find the secret numbers attached to our favorite products in 15 different categories, and you'll be entered to win one of two Notch Pro Access bags. Head to treestuff.com find to see the categories that contain a product with a secret number. Then search for any product that you think is our favorite. The secret numbers will only show up when you search for the product by name in the search bar. Once you have all 15 numbers, you'll add them up and enter the sum into the form at the bottom of treestuff.com slash find. You only have until Sunday, May 24th to find all of the numbers, so get hunting. If you're looking to share your opinions with TreeStuff and make some money, you're in luck. You can film a TreeStuff review and earn gift certificates for use on TreeStuff. Just film at least a minute and a half of your opinions on your favorite TreeStuff products and we'll put you on the site and send you a $10 gift code per video. To start reviewing, head to treestuff.com review to read the video requirements and upload. I'm Carson with treestuff.com and I'd like to ask you to take a second to learn about the Fallen Families Fund. It's a charity created to provide small cash donations to families who have been affected by the death or injury of a working arborist. All of the administrative costs are covered by Cheryl Inc., so 100% of your contribution goes to help families in their time of healing and recovery. You can learn more and donate at www.fallenfamiliesfund.org. Trio Caching is a fun tree stuff program based around searching for hidden treasure in the trees. Volunteer arborists from around the world have set caches in their area for climbers to seek out using GPS, their wits, and their climbing skills. To start trio caching, all you have to do is go to treestuff.com slash treeocache and find a cache near you. We have a few new trio caches to announce. Brandon Othan of Arizona has set trio cache 87 near Phoenix. Sid Howells of Social Climbers in the UK has set up two trio caches number 108 near Southampton, and number 109 near Guildford. If you'd like to find these caches, or any of the other caches around the world, you can request the coordinates at treestuff.com slash treocache. The North Carolina Tree Stuff Party has been rescheduled from April until August 1st. It's hosted by Nick Johnson in Waynesville, North Carolina, and will go from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Stuff Party has been rescheduled for September 5th and is being hosted by Jason Dudek. You can find more information on the Tree Stuff Facebook events page. For more information and addresses, head to our Facebook events page. You can also get more information about these and upcoming Tree Stuff parties by going to treestuff.com slash parties. Keep your mouth shut and your ears open. You've got to truly humble yourself every day and realize that one bad decision will be your last if it's the wrong. Never stop learning. 
learn and study a good arborist as much as possible. Watch them, watch how they work in a tree. You know, get their two cents, especially in business. That's been the biggest challenge for me is, is finding out that a relative degree of skill will not carry me through, that I needed to be diligent as well about the business side of things. If you haven't already gone to some sort of trade show, competition, whatever, uh, you know, get out and just shake hands with people. You, you'd be amazing. You'd be amazed how welcoming everybody is and how much they want to be there to help you. Uh, it's pretty inspirational. Don't just take one person's advice, you know. Seek out as, as much information as you possibly can. And also realize that it's not a single man sport. This is a team sport. It's a team occupation. And how we interact with each other and how we make each other feel is just as important as how great you can climb and how wonderful you can race. You gotta expose yourself to greatness. You know, you you don't 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 settle. If you feel like you're gridlocked and you're not learning, move on and go find somewhere where you can learn and grow, you know. So. That's probably the best advice I can give. Soak it up like a sponge everywhere you can get it. We've been having. Uh, we're back. We, we hope that we have them somewhat straightened out. I apologize uh, for this, but we should be good to go now. And we're going to talk about the spotted lantern fly, um, how it was discovered in Berks County in Pennsylvania in 2014. Uh, and it's been spreading throughout uh, jumping states, you know, uh, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, West Virginia, and Virginia now. Uh, it's attacking 70 different types of species. You know, uh, it really likes scrapes. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, the hardwoods, ailanthus, walnut, maple, birch trees, sycamores, pears. Um, the eggs are being laid on any surface. Uh, they're travelers, you know, if it's a rusty object, if it's a rail car, if it's anything, if it's a NASCAR race, you know, if they can get there and lay the eggs or hitchhike, that's, that's what they're doing. Um, they're feeding on the plants. Uh, they're removing the sap, which is causing some, uh, honeydew, which is unattractive, which is the big problem. And then the sooty mold grows from that. We're not really seeing very many predators at them at all. Uh, you know, spiders, praying mantis, will birds, but nothing enough to knock down this population that's escalating. Uh, chickens don't seem to want to eat them at all. Uh, other mammals are avoiding them. Uh, we're going to talk about all the different control options uh, tonight, uh, whether it's scraping eggs, sticky bands. Uh, we're going to talk about the insecticides that are out there and the different options of what you can use. Um, and let's kind of get into where it's been found. You know, so it's a hitchhiker. <clears throat> it's been found so far in these states. Um, can we go on to the next slide? Thank you. So the spotted lanternfly has been found in these states, guys. It, it started in PA and it's just been exploding the population. Uh, it's five miles from Ohio is what I believe the la last report was. Uh, it was found in West Virginia. Uh, it unfortunately hitchhiked down to Virginia on a stone pallet and that, that's where it was um, exploded into another population. Um, <clears throat> it's in New Jersey. Uh, they've seen it up in the Connecticut and Mass area and it's slowly growing. Um, you know, I, I live about two hours probably away from uh, Ground Zero and I've got them uh, 10 minutes from my house now. So they, they're definitely moving. They like to ride on cars in that aspect. Um, some of the new PA counties uh, where it's been seen, you can see the existing quarantine and how it seems to be spreading. You know, there's been a lot of action in the Lancaster in, in that area, and it seems to be growing um, rapidly. I mean, uh, we're only putting a Band-Aid on this because it's out in the forest, it's out in the woods. Uh, you know, hopefully we'll be able to come up with some sort of bacteria or something in that sense, but it's spreading. Um, so talk about it, you know. 
look at the look at the bug that it is. It, you know, a lot of people will say that it's this beautiful bug, but you know what? It's a real pest. Uh, as you can see in the upper left corner, guys, that that's an older egg mass. There's a newer one below it. They'll actually lay eggs on old egg sacs. Uh, they they have no preference or care. Uh, you can see how hard it is to see the egg masses on that river birch uh, just gently under that branch. Um, it'll go underneath the bark of your silver maples. Um, native to India or China or Japan or Vietnam, it, it, it literally walked right through uh, Korea, and they pretty much have the same climate zone as us. And we'll get into the life cycle with this next slide. <clears throat> so the eggs will uh, be laid from October to June. Uh, you're going to see the first NSAR start hatching. Uh, I believe uh, some people have talked to me in some of the microclimates in Pennsylvania. They're actually starting to hatch. Uh, your second NSTAR will happen through June through July, and your third NSTAR uh, will be going on that. The fourth NSTAR is when they start really amping up, and you see the red colors, and that's when they start leaving your perennials, uh, anything like that, like the first instars, you're not going to see them on the trees like we see the adults. They're going to work on the smaller perennials, rose bushes, hydrangeas, burning bushes. All these different um, avenues are what they're going to attack and go after. Um, we were thinking that they were staying in the trees and feeding guys, but essentially they're not. They're, they're actually moving down into the landscape, going through the turf, and they're trying to get to... Um, the Alanthus, the black walnuts, the sumacs, anything with uh, the juggling or the, the poisonous sap that they can get because we believe they, they use that as a deterrent from all the, the predators out there for them. Uh, the next photo is showing uh, the female, which is on the bottom left, and the male on the top. The female is identified by the red tip on the abdomen. As you can see in the picture, uh, that that's how we determine what they are and uh, where they're coming from. The next photo here is really interesting. Is this is it uh, molting from the fourth instar and or the fifth instar and or the fourth instar into the adult? Um, this literally took less than thirty minutes, and this spotted lanternfly could fly. That, that's how fast it could. We literally held it in our hand, and within 30 minutes, it was able to fly. That, that's how fast uh, this moves forward. <clears throat> Why is this pest different? Well, first off, exponential reproduction, guys. Uh, it's producing, you know, 30 to 50 eggs at one time. So the population can go very, very fast, and really nothing was being done in the early stages of this. Uh, it has a wide variety of hosts that it will go after. Mobility is, is key. There's no general predators, and nothing's been going on in the forested areas. So this population has been building and building and building. Uh, the next thing is the population game, all right? So just taking a look at 2012 when we think that it may have gotten here and we didn't identify it till 2014 you know if there was just 17 females look at the population what it could be now i mean that that is just a scary thought looking how many uh lanternflies there are and you can see wh what they look like on a tree you know th this is typical up and down a hot tree um so as i started to say earlier this is what it looks like the instars feeding on perennial shrubs and trees like that. Uh, this is uh, some of the photos from the extension agent Brian Walsh that you see, uh, but they're not on trees. They're, they're going after these uh, perennials because it's probably softer tissue that they can feed on and, and get the nutrients that they need to continue to grow. As we said, <clears throat> they prefer Alanthus. You know, in the beginning, the, the feeling was that they had to have Alanthus to go on. And I think that's starting to change now because we're seeing some black walnut and sumac coming into that. Uh, 
you can see how they're completely covered over uh, the larger, the branches. The interesting thing with this, guys, when we were doing our research in um, Pennsylvania, we noticed how the instars, uh, you know, we were seeing 150 to 200 egg sacs on some of the trees on the outside of the subdivision. But when we started doing the sticky band test to see where they were going, actually going through the turf and making their way back into uh, that area, <clears throat> going towards the Atlantis to the black walnuts that were on the back of the property, which is interesting. These are just some different photos uh, to give you guys an idea of what they look like and how they can be in different stages. The eggs t typically hatch at different times, so like you'll have different uh, areas of it. You know, uh, when I was in Pennsylvania last year, I saw a microclimate on an HOA building. Uh, it was a south side of a building. They were hatching in April, you know, early uh, or late April, but it was very, very early for them. Um, and the next uh, photo is that what I wanted to talk about was what uh, Kelly Hoover <clears throat> and her team and Brian Walsh with Penn State did. Uh, they did a dispersal of spotted lanternfly nymphs in the forest just to see uh, what they were doing, you know, how far could they travel? And, and they did, it was very unique, uh, the study, what they did. It was an experimental design. Um, in the next slide uh, coming up, we're gonna see, they released it from one central point. So it was 12 different sections uh, and they were allowed to uh, spread out. The neat thing was, is they put a, a um, powder to make them glow in the dark they could go out or like a blue light and see them. And they were gonna flag this and see how far that they would travel, you know, um, every, every five meters that it went out 50 meters. <clears throat> so uh, the next photo is showing some of the photos of what they saw in the landscape, these nymphs traveling through the forest floor and how they lit up and some of the different spots they went out to in the forest uh, as they were moving forward. The preliminary analysis, though, what was uh, really neat about this is, you know, one day they traveled 6.1 meters. In seven days, they were at 19.2. In 10 days, these nymphs were traveling 65 meters from the release point. So that, that's quite a distance that they moved. You know, some of the limitations uh, that they talked about <clears throat> were uh, the day glow powders could have caused some freedom of movement, uh, persistence or the rain could have caused it to make it a little bit harder for them to move. Uh, were, were, would they still be able to malt and survive with this powder on? Uh, but they did laser searches every 10 meters <clears throat> or two feet off the ground to, and they got fewer detections. So they seem to be moving out or spreading with this. Um, So damage, these are some of the things that we've seen strange damage um, <clears throat> that's been recorded in nursery production. You know, different signs or heavy feeding of these spotted lanternfly in these. And you can see in the picture, you, you've got bark that looks a little different, uh, you know, buckled crevices, necrosis, you know, lots of different things going on. Um, <clears throat> and following this up, you know, in the past 30 months, we've had above rainfall in the Pennsylvania area. So there was tons of reports of this verticillian wilt coming through or outbreaks being reported in red maples. Um, if you can move forward the slide. So we're, we're seeing different photos coming in, you know, and people are concerned that it's verticillium wilt. So the thought process is, could lanternfly be moving verticillium wilt, which would be a real big concern. Or <clears throat> are they weakening trees that ambrosia beetles are be being more active? So all of these were some questions that came up and, and that were being asked at the time. So <clears throat> Penn State sent out uh, to the pathology lab in the next slide that there was no verticillium uh, being found with this. But with the, the inspections, is what they found was cankers and necrotic tissue that was identical to what was happening in the nursery. 
So now what we're seeing is damage being caused by the spotted lanternfly, you know, that's causing uh, effects that we ha haven't seen. And whether it's because of the rain or not, th this pest is evolving and, and we're seeing the different effects. So we're going to see more wounding. Uh, as you can see there, uh, the next photo is a great photo uh, by uh, Nick Slough of the Penn State Extension Group, how they stick their style in and it goes in and feeds. And what we've seen, <clears throat> at least uh, what Arborjet and I have seen in the data is the healthier the tree, the more active the lanternfly are feeding on them. They seem to be attacking them more often, uh, uh, going after uh, silver maples that are healthier. So it's not like an emerald ash borer or anything like that that's attacking a tree that's stressed or anything like that. They seem to want to have healthier trees. And I think it's because they have difficult feeding with the stylet that they have that a healthier tree allows them to use the tree's transpiration to get uh, more food and nutrients. Um, the next photo is just kind of a picture uh, discussing the sticky band control. Uh, one of the issues with sticky band control is um, you get a lot of other pests, squirrels, birds, you know, sometimes it's better to put like a chicken wire mesh over it to inhibit some of the other animals. But the really neat thing that we've seen in our research is they'll literally, uh, when they're in the <clears throat> instar stage, build a bridge going across the sticky bands in a matter of days to where they can get up and down in the tree. Um, host plant range. You know, it really depends on the life cycle stage that they're on, but uh, they love Alanthus, they love black walnut, and as soon as they get that fix of that, you know, later in the season, because Alanthus seem to, to lose their leaves before most of the trees, then they go on to the maples and really start hitting the trees. Uh, they seem to attack the most <clears throat> healthy trees. They love areas like, like that. Um, when we did our research, they were attacking all the hedgerows where the Alanthus are and that aspect of it. <clears throat> The big problem, too, that uh, us as arborists, when we go out there, is the effects of the honeydew. You know, the homeowners are calling because their decks are being covered with black sooty mold, their patios. Uh, all this becomes issues that uh, we have to address and, and take care of. And that's why right now we're not seeing uh, death of trees, but we're seeing wounds and big issues uh, for homeowners. Uh, Honeydew and subsequent sooty mold, you know. Uh, these are the photos from the research that we did with umbrellas uh, in one of the neighborhoods. And literally, they would just turn black, guys. The amazing thing is people left them alone, as I've said before. But uh, literally, <clears throat> they'll just turn black because there's so much uh, honeydew and sooty mold dropping down on them. This is kind of a best management practice that Penn State releases. Uh, you know, they're saying January through April and no, November and December, we're scraping eggs. Uh, you know, they're saying that you could spray dormant oil on uh, February, March. We're working on some different products now to see if we can have some effectiveness to knock down this population uh, by killing the eggs. You know, sticky trap bans, uh, contact insecticides made through October. Soil drench, uh, uh, systemic, you know, post bloom after the flowering, uh, they're going April through October. And then systemic sprays, you know, June through Ju late June, July, August, and probably ending in September. So, some of the conditions that we look for when we go out into this, you know, what plants are on site? Are there any hot plants, uh, you know, whether it's silver maples, uh, river birch? any types of trees. We really haven't seen them attack oak trees, but that doesn't mean that they won't because uh, basically they're going after a food source. You know, whatever they can do to survive. Um, the other questions that we have to ask, you know, whether if we're doing bark sprays or if we're doing soil drenches, we need to make sure how many trees are on site and how many need to be treated. Uh, could we go off label because of the uh, label laws on the amount? <clears throat> so we have to have application choices. Uh, you know, 
And some of the advantages of injections is you're a lot more environmentally friendly with this compared to your bark spray soil drenches or foiler sprays. So here's some of the great photos. Uh, look at the uh, silver maple there, guys. Just complete coverage. And I mean, that literally will go up the tree completely. So th this was one tree that we were doing research on, 46 inch silver maple. We killed 48,000 in three months, guys. And that was just unchecked feeding, you know, to the tree. If we didn't treat it, it it's causing damage. Uh, the one thing that we have to keep in mind too, when we're doing injections or we're doing anything that they have to feed to die. So if we have any droughts or anything like that or extended periods where the trees aren't transpiring, then we may not get active kill if uh, the nutrient material isn't moving or they're not feeding on the trees. Uh, and we've also seen some really strange things happening with these trees uh, after the feeding. You know, some big differences uh, in the looks of them. Uh, you can see in the photo in the bottom, different bud uh, surges or looks in it. So different things are happening to these trees. And we have to ask, you know, over the time as we get into this, you know, uh, up in Pennsylvania, we're almost six years into it, are, are we going to start seeing death of these trees? Are, are we going to see issues from that? Uh, so uh, we have to ask the question about that. <clears throat> Some of the agricultural issues, this is really hitting hard on, on the grape growers and, and the vineyards. And, and to tell you how bad it is, you know, some of these vineyards are reporting almost a 90% loss in yield on, on their uh, growth the next year because the, the feeding's so significant, the grapes just don't have the energy to continue or get the good abundance. Um, the next photo with the uh, attacking the apples, uh, what we've seen with apples is they're not a, a, as favorite but they'll fly through and stop and eat but they'll continue to move on because it's not like grapes where they'll just sit there and continue to uh, eat on the pest as they do hot trees you know there, there's so many different hot trees that are out there but uh, the, the interesting thing with this pest is they'll move like one day they'll be at one house the homeowner will call the arborist will come out and the bugs are gone and then two days later, they'll come back and the bugs are back. So they, they seem to be moving. If it's really wet or raining, this pest doesn't move. So when we have really nice days, they're actively moving. And it seems like they move in packs or troves, like they'll just go to the next tree and move. So, so we'll see these hot trees and that aspect of it. Uh, some of the insecticide options out there. So what we've been recommending as our first treatment would be an injection of Imaget in uh, late June, early July, and that should give you at least season-long control of that pest. Um, some of the bark sprays, uh, they, they are effective, but you have to remember timing. Uh, a lot of guys went out in May and treated with bark sprays, and they did not get the season because it was so wet, and dinotefuron is very... Uh, water soluble, so uh, it did not last the entire season. So if you're gonna do bark sprays, I would recommend going later in the year, maybe in August, uh, start doing that to make sure you get the, the season long control. Um, some of the issues that we saw <clears throat> when this pest is really in a high population and abundance, you, you have to uh, monitor that and you may uh, wanna put in your program or note that you may ha have another injection of like uh, ace jet a as a follow-up in september because if populations are high it, it may need uh additional a thing or if we had a ton of rain you know we, we have to take an effect that the chemical may be diluted by the amount of rainfall so all these we need to take into account because i would be going out <clears throat> and visiting uh some different customers and uh customers were complaining that they weren't getting control. And then when I would go out to the tree, I would look at the tree and, and there was no honeydew or black sooty mold. And to me, that means the tree's protected. But the homeowner was complaining that because maybe there was 20 or 30 bugs on the trunk of the tree. But when you look up in the tree, there was no pest. So we need to explain to our customers what is expected uh, by treatment so they're aware of it. And with this, 
uh, it will give us the flexibility, you know, we're trying to kill this, but we're not going to eradicate this pest. I mean, the neighbors may not be treating. Uh, you could have a forest next to you that are a ton of lanternfly. So uh, we're, we're just trying to save the trees and lessen the attack on the trees on the property is essentially what we're, what we're looking to do. Um, Kale, is there any questions uh, before we get into the kind of uh, some of the graphs and stuff like that? I have one question here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Reinhardt Nutto uh, wants to know what type of licensing you need uh, for using Imaget on spotted lantern flies. You would probably need your commercial license and probably turf and ornamental, uh, depending on the state regulations. Okay. Um, otherwise, I don't think we have anything else somebody might pop a uh, another question on the screen here in a little bit but uh, i'm ready to go ahead if you are perfect let's go so uh the next slide is the dead spotted lanternfly this was our test uh showing uh the effectiveness of imaget versus untreated uh in 2018, uh, we're continuing to do more studies and uh, trying some different experimental stuff. Uh, and hopefully uh, we'll see some uh, good things coming from these uh, newer products that we've been working with and uh, some of our egg studies. Uh, so essentially just to cover uh, what we recommend, we're, we're going with our Imaget. Uh, if it's a high population, uh, we, we may recommend a, a follow-up uh, injection with our Ace Jet. We do have a great website, um, ArborJet uh, Support, which would be goodbye, spottedlanternfly.com. Uh, and if you're a homeowner, uh, you can read there, or if you're professionals, you can be listed there, and, and we can talk about that and <clears throat> essentially like that. And that, that's mainly my update on Spotted Lanternfly, and now I've kind of got just some um, stuff on uh, fertilization and enhancement programs that we have. Uh, our Arbor RX program, uh, this is a great prescription fertilizer program and enhancement. It's a great way for uh, your PHC or your, or your IPM program to go out and introduce fertilization to it. Uh, so it's gonna give you a tree and shrub nutrition. It's gonna help maximize your tree and shrub health. It's gonna combine uh, plant nutrition with some soil enhancement qualities. Uh, it's going to help stimulate root growth. And the best part is, is this program doesn't need uh, agitation. So your liquid solutions can be in your tanks and you don't have to agitate it. And most of the products are all tank compatible. So you can uh, mix different things as you go forward. Um, so we, we kind of have a, a, a different mix uh, of products. The Arborplex is our lead product. It's a slow release nitrogen. Uh, so this is going to be for any uh, good for any tree or shrub nutrition. And then we have different products based on plant soil or environmental conditions. Uh, we have an iron plus that would be for your iron nutrition, uh, you know, chlorotic areas in your landscape to so your shrubs uh, that you're seeing some chlorotic issues. Um, Bio MP is very unique because that's going to be where you have. Um, soil, um Essentially, you have organic matter that you need to be broke down. It has molasses in it. It's going to give uh, increased uh, micro, uh, microbial activity in that. Uh, Enviroplex is kind of an acid soil conditioner. So this, this is going to help build soil structure and nutrient availability in soils that aren't showing that. Uh, Nutriroot is a fantastic product, whether you're planting landscape plants or if you're just going to be one a uh, all around good fertilization program. Uh, it has micronutrients, it has uh, the hydrotain product in it, uh, some seaweed extracts. So this is something that you can use to help with improved transplants. Uh, some of your disease issues that we saw and talked about in the landscape. Uh, Cytogrow is a great product. It's a root hormone biostimulate, which will help with root mass. It works hand in hand with your growth regulators that are out there. 
And then Hydratain is a great product for root zone uh, moisture management to help <clears throat> increase moisture availability in the landscape in that aspect of things. So this program is essentially broken down by tree and soil conditions. So this takes the guesswork out for you. So BioMP you would use for general maintenance or sandy soils or where there's just poor soil, you know, like your builder sections or developer areas, uh, low organic matter, um, declining trees. The Enviroplex could be pretty much used in any of those situations. Uh, iron deficiencies where Iron Plus, NutriRoot plays into sandy soils and that uh, I have a customer uh, at the beaches in Delaware that has been using NutriRoot on 12,000 trees and he's seen such great results with it. Uh, he sees, he's, in see, he's seen improvement when he does uh, his insecticide and uh, disease control on uh, whether it's a uh, soil injection or bark sprays, he's seen improvements in that. Um, the Hydratane product, that's something that you would use in the summertime. You know, if uh, customers are going away and, and they're worried about their plants, that could be a drought management product that you guys use for your uh, IPMs uh, programs or anything like that. Uh, Cytogrow, just a great overall product for rooting. Uh, Hydrotain Cytogrow, you could use for your seeding and sodding uh, aspects too in the landscape is another thing to do. <clears throat> the next product uh, is new. Uh, Menjet FE, but we've been working with it. We've had a product called uh, Menjet Iron. And as you guys know in the past, uh, we had to wait till later summer to use that. Uh, this product gives us more flexibility. We came up with a summer rate and we have a higher fall rate. But the nice thing is, is it's designed for injection or foliar application. So you can use this on shrubs, uh, trees, but you're gonna get consistent long lasting results. And our um, technical manager in Texas uh, took these photos. Uh, this is down in uh, Texas and they were going to remove uh, this oak tree in the upcoming slide. You guys will see it here coming up. Uh, so that's October, 2015. They were gonna cut this tree down. You can see it's confined, typical parking lot tree. It's struggling. Uh, Emmett did the injection with the Menjet iron in 2016. And you can see uh, the tree uh, responded uh, from the injection. And then that's June. And then, then the next photo, you know, June of 2018, he got three years of green up from one application of the Minjet FE. Uh, and then he retreated it in 2018. And this time he included uh, the product shortstop in the application. And look at the tree in 2019. I mean, that, that is just tremendous turnaround from a tree that looks extremely healthy in that aspect of it. And then the other product that I wanted to mention is Palm Jet, all right? And this, granted, I know it said that it's Palm Jet, but this could also be uh, is labeled for hardwoods, and this adds magnesium to help maintain a green foliage. So this is a fantastic product product, uh, whether you're using it for palm trees or, or hardwoods, this is something that you can use. Uh, it stops the frizzle top or uh, other seasonal deficiencies. Uh, and roughly, you know, a six to 15 foot palm is like a dollar 30 in, in cost. So it's a great uh, product. It's something that you can use for hardwoods as well. Um, here's some before and afters with it that you can see the difference. Uh, it's pretty significant how they green up you know, and some pruning and changes in that. Uh, but it's definitely uh, interesting to see the difference with those. And one of the last things that I, I want to touch on is uh, shortstop, 2SD, a growth regulator. Uh, we, we just got EPA approval for this as a shrub label. So you can use it as a basal drench and a uh, shrub treatment, uh, which is very exciting. Uh, it gives us one of the most flexible growth regulators out there now with this. Uh, it's going to help with pruning, you know, so you're not going to have as much pruning issues if you want to. It's a great uh, opportunity for street trees in that sense. Uh, 
it enhances the uh, root hair growth. I have actually am in the process of doing a study on my boxwoods now as a basal drench and a uh, foliar application. I hope to have photos in some of my upcoming uh, webinars to show you guys that. But it's pretty exciting uh, looking at the differences between a foliar application and a uh, basal drench six weeks into it, uh, watching the difference. Uh, this is a great tool if you're going to be doing construction uh, work. You know, if you know there's going to be significant damage, if you can go in and apply this beforehand, it will help the tree significantly in that. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes used in chlorosis management and uh, as we talked about, uh, bacterial leaf scorch. So some of the uh, physiological changes from pectobutrazole would be an increased production of the root hairs, uh, thicker leaf cuticles. Uh, more leaf hairs, increased chlorophyll in that aspect of it, uh, smaller stomata, smaller leaves. Uh, I've used it on my red maples in um, my uh, parkway of my trees here in my neighborhood. And it was amazing to me the difference. Uh, the leaves were significantly smaller, but uh, nice dark green. And the big difference that I noticed is, you know, when we got that uh, dry spell or drought in late August uh, here, my trees didn't lose their leaves. You know, most of my neighborhood trees stressed out and got fall colors and some even defoliated, but my trees probably held till um, really November when we really got a hard frost and then they uh, lost their leaves fairly quickly after that. <clears throat> this will give you uh, carbo carbohydrate storage as well. Um, some and drought mechanisms, guys, this is the big thing, uh, it, it gives you drought resistance. So it's a big help in some of these street trees and things like that. Um, th this is a photo kind of showing uh, 2017. Uh, we treated every other tree in the fall of 2017. Uh, the first photo is before and that's the after. Uh, you can see the difference in the trees that were treated and, and the look of them. So it does make a difference for uh, leaf scorch and that and the drought resilience. Uh, untreated versus uh, patri or short stop, you can see the difference, guys. You can see the difference in the leaf scorch and how the, the tree handles it. Um, kind of wrapping up, support. If you guys need anything, we have a awesome team of certified arborists, agronomists, uh, pest control, advisors. Uh, Joe DeCola is our head of research and development. Uh, Don Grossman is our PhD in etymology. Uh, J.M. Alexi is our research and formulations. Uh, Dr. Poy is our doctor of plant medicine. And then we do have an agronomist in Jim Spindler. So we have a lot of tools. So if you guys have questions, feel free to email us or contact us and we can point you in the right direction uh, with some of your concerns or anything like that. And I love seeing before and afters if you guys have anything. And um, I'm very appreciative of that. And uh, that kind of wraps up what I had. If you guys have questions or anything, uh, I'm ready. All right. Um, I do have a couple questions here. Okay. Uh, so we've got Matt Stone in Northeast Pennsylvania. Uh, he says talking about spotted lanternfly we don't have any here yet uh, what should I be doing to prepare my customers for spotted lantern fly, fly? Uh, I think a flyer uh, talking about it uh, making them aware of it uh, maybe uh, starting inspections looking for them uh, give them some photos of what to look for so they can alert you of it would be awesome you know, a, a, a blog post or a Facebook if he's doing social media uh, impact. That, that's always an awesome way to do it. But uh, an email with some photos explaining what it is and uh, what to look for is always helpful and uh, just to be on the lookout for it so they're prepared and ready. Do you, are there any um, particular treatments that you would uh, recommend to prepare for it? So... Um, and like using short stop or something to make sure that your trees are specifically healthy, healthy in a certain way. 
Yeah, I, I mean, that's going to help uh, uh, healthier, thicker cuticles. Anything like that uh, would be good. Um, uh, even a phosphojet uh, application it will make a tree healthier. You know, it'll turn on the tree's uh, defense system in that sense. Whether you do a bark spray or an injection, you know, that, that's a tool that you could do uh, that would help them. Um, you know, good IPN monitoring for the pest, being proactive so you're aware of it when it hits so you can get a jump on it before the population bu builds is really key in my mind. Okay. Um, I have another one here. Uh, Peter Owens. Uh, he's asking if Arborjet has any available literature laying out uh, what each product does um, and what you should use for them, where they can go, wh where you can go to find this sort of information. Uh, if he visits our website, we have tons of information there with catalogs, uh, pest reference guide of what different pests there are uh, that, uh, and what products to use. Uh, all that information, uh, if you wanted to email me, I'm happy to send them information, PDFs or anything like that. Uh, please get, shoot me an email. Uh, but our website is a great tool uh, and it can get us in touch. You know, we're, we're happy to help or send you uh, any of our documents on spotted lanternfly research, uh, sales sheets, anything like that uh, we have and I'm happy to share. All right, here's one from Daniel, Danielle Wolliver, uh, who it looks like she's a laboratory technician at FDA CS uh, Division of Plant Industry. Uh, so she's looking for what kind of information or research you think is currently lacking with regards to the spotted lanternfly uh, and the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, it sounds like she's trying to find something to do a thesis on? Uh, I, I think anything, um, you know, uh, different uh, controls for spotted lanternfly, uh, the uh, bovarian, you know, the fungus like uh, with gypsy moth, you know, anything like that would be an interesting paper uh, to do a thesis on. Um, why they're so... Um, evasive, you know, pest-wise? Why, why is nothing eating them? Why is there no uh, natural predators against them? You know, something like that would be interesting because they seem to go unchecked, like nothing's really attacking the spotted lanternfly, other than the few instances of the, the bovarian fungus that uh, hit them in Pennsylvania. You know, they really haven't had a knockdown. Okay. Um, let's see if there's anything else in here. Um, yeah, she, uh, <laughs> there we go. Um, she says it's that time of year to submit new research proposals. Um, George Marek is asking, are there any resources for companies looking to get licensed for plant health care, uh, state specific or otherwise, I guess, where would you start would be a good, uh, you, you could start at your, uh, uh, extension agent. Uh, you know, if you Google, uh, whatever state, whether it was Pennsylvania, uh, pesticide applicators test, that would bring it up. You know, anything like that, uh, if you Google, it should come up and, and give you the proper steps of uh, what direction and how to go about doing it. Okay, I'm going to give everyone uh, maybe about 30, 45 more seconds here since there is a delay. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Any any closing advice uh, for people who are looking at uh, spotted lanternfly coming towards them? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, your best defense is to be proactive. Uh, go out, search for them, look for the pest, uh, you know, look at the internet, look at some of the different photos that you've seen and, and try to find it before the population builds because if you can go out and treat for it and knock it down you're, you're you're going to save yourself so much you know if it's one or two here or there if you can actually get out and kill them before they spread or start laying eggs that's going to save you because 
Granted, we're not going to do anything out in the forested areas, but if you can stop the urban environment or where your customers are, that, that's going to save you some headaches in, in my mind. You know, be, being that proactive hunter uh, and, and looking at the different treatment options. And, and I do think that it's worth doing. You know, what, what we've seen is some of the egg spraying does help. You know, if we can knock down, because you might have 150 to 200 egg sacs on one tree, and that's, you know, top to bottom, and you can't always spray the top of those trees. So whatever we can do to stop um, the spread of this pest, I think, is ideal because it's just going to continue to go. And to me, it's probably a lot worse than the emerald ash borer in my mind because it's attacking so many different trees you know the it, it, it doesn't just have one species and that's it this is attacking 70 different trees so it's a big issue uh, and, and we you know if we can be proactive in some of these uh new areas maybe we can stop the spread being as fast as it's been all right well thank you very much uh for taking your time to do this uh and for all of your work in uh, fighting the spotted lanternfly so far. Um, I want to thank everyone who watched for sticking around uh, and for your patience with our little bit of technical difficulties we had earlier. Uh, we will be back uh, with some more webinars uh, later on. I believe that we're going to do some climbing stuff. Um, so keep an eye out for that. You can find everything about our webinars at treestuff.com slash webinars or you can go to the Facebook events page and everything's there. Um, I will get the quiz link up on Facebook um, and in the event page in a couple minutes here. So uh, once again, thanks Trent and thank you everyone thank for you. watching. Thank you. Thank you all for watching and thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. Have a nice night. Yep, you too.